Today I'm going to be going over the Marine Builders Chemistry Chapter 9 Comprehension Check. And the title of this chapter is Chemists Have Solutions. And so it's all about different types of solutions in the chapter. So the first question on the comprehension check gives you a list of solids and it tells you that they're dissolved in water. And it wants us for each solute to identify what specific substance are in the solution and whether or not the solution would conduct electricity. So to determine this, we need to actually go and look and see if these are ionic compounds or covalent compounds. And so it's been a few chapters since we've really um, studied ionic compounds, but ionic compounds are compounds that contain a metal and a non-metal. And a covalent compound is a compound that contains both non-metals. So if we take our first compound, we have, I have potassium, which is a metal. And then I recognize, because I learned these from chapter eight, CO3 is an ion, a polyatomic ion called carbonate. And so this has a metal in it. So this is an ionic compound. So in water, ionic compounds will split into their parts and conduct electricity. So in the solution, so I will have two potassiums and two carbonate ions, and this compound will conduct electricity. So if we're looking at the next one, we have a carbon and two sulfurs. And both of these are non-metals. And so it is a covalent compound and it will not conduct electricity. It also doesn't break apart. So in the solution, you would still have carbon disulfide. All right, so this, if I'm looking at C, where I have C2H4O2. In this compound, there is no metal. So it is a covalent compound. You may recognize that it's a molecular formula, not an empirical formula, because it can be simplified. And so since there's no metal and it's not ionic, it's not going to conduct electricity and it's not going to break apart. So it's going to stay this compound in water. The fourth compound, I recognize an ammonium ion and a nitrate ion. So these are both polyatomic ions. So this these are an ionic bond, and when they are put into water, it will split into an ammonium and into a nitrate, and it will conduct electricity. And question number two tells us that we have a saturated solution of ammonium gas. So basically, you have some type of vessel, let's say a beaker, and it has in it water, and they've dissolved in this ammonium gas. And so what would happen if we were to decrease the temperature of the water? And so gases behave very different when they're the solute than do solids. A gas is dissolved in something. If it gets colder, it can actually hold more of the gas. And so in this instance, if I have a vessel and I have water and ammonium nitrate, ammonium dissolved into it, as the temperature goes down, nothing will happen. I won't see anything happen. What would happen is the water would actually gain the ability to hold more of the ammonium gas. And so the solution, as the temperature goes down, since it could actually hold more gas, would no longer be saturated. So question number two, part B, we still have our ammonium gas dissolved in a sample. And the question asks us, what happens if the pressure is decreased? What's gonna happen? So if we have a beaker, I am not an artist, we have a liquid in it, So if we have a beaker and we have a liquid and dissolved in it is a gas, you're not actually gonna see bubbles, but that's the best way for me to show it, okay? And so the pressure above it is decreased. It's kind of like saying you have a Coke can and it's pressurized in it. And when you open the can, the pressure above it is decreased because some of the air, the gases can escape. There's not the top pushing it on. Well, when this air comes off, some of the solubility actually goes down. So the amount of gas this can hold goes down because it's not pushing more of it in. And so some of the gas will actually come out. So some of the ammonium would actually have to leave the solution. Now the resulting solution is still considered saturated because the solubility decreased when the pressure decreased. All right, question number three. We have a solution 
of sodium bromide and it's a solid and it is not a saturated solution but I want a saturated I want a saturated solution unfortunately however I have no more of sodium bromide what can I do to the temperature to make it have a saturated solution so I'm going to use this as a my water molecules and let's say I have some type of vessel here so for my sodium bromide we're going to use red so i've added some sodium bromide to it but there's not a saturated solution and what i mean by that is there's still some spaces where i could put sodium bromide and so but i don't have any more what can i do so that it is a saturated solution and it cannot hold any more well, something I can do is I can actually lower the temperature because when something gets colder, the molecules stop moving as much and they get closer together. And so as the water molecules get cooler and they get closer together, my water will no longer be able to hold, it cannot hold any more sodium bromide. So there's less spaces for sodium bromide. So my solution becomes saturated. What I would do to the temperature to make the solution saturated is I would decrease the temperature. Question number four is writing an equation and then balancing it. And I know that for some students, this is very intimidating, but you just have to take this one bite at a time and just go like step by step through the problem. So the question tells us calcium phosphate is insoluble in water. If a solution of potassium phosphate is mixed with a solution of calcium chloride, what is a chemical equation for the reaction that occurs? So the first part is actually not in the first sentence, which makes it a little confusing. But the first part, it tells me the reactants right here. So I have to remember how to write formulas. So I have potassium phosphate. So if you'll look on your periodic table, potassium is on the left and we use a K for potassium. And phosphate is a polyatomic ion that you should know. If you look on your periodic table, you're gonna see potassium is a metal. So it's on the left side of your periodic table. It's actually in the first column. And phosphate's a polyatomic ion that was on that list from the last chapter that you should have memorized. So potassium has a charge of plus one because it's on the first column. It's a group 1A element. And phosphate has a charge or of negative three. Or to make the first part, I have to balance the charges. And so I'm gonna have three potassium, sorry, I'm gonna have three potassiums and just one phosphate. This is doing the crisscross method. I don't know if you guys remember this, but this was from many chapters ago. And so this would give me a total charge on potassium of positive three and a total on phosphate of negative three. All right, so the second reactant So it tells me that these are solutions. And so if these are solutions, they're aqueous. We're gonna write your phases. The next one it tells you is calcium chloride. All right, so calcium's a metal. You'll notice it in the second column, the second group. So it has a, it has a charge, we say it's two plus and chlorine is negative one because it's a halogen and it's... So I wanna balance these charges out across the two down here and the one down here. So it gives me a total charge on calcium of two positive and on chlorine of two negative. So now those are the reactants, so we're gonna figure out the products. So I know in the products I have calcium phosphate and I know it is not soluble in water, which means it's like a precipitate is what we call this. So it's when you have two liquids and you mix them together and you will see it kind of like precipitation outside, but it falls into the bottom of the beaker. We talk about precipitation outside, we're talking about rain and snow and sleet and hail, but a precipitate is when you have two liquids together and you're gonna see a solid and we say it falls out of the solution. So you'll kind of see it, fall down into the bottom of the beaker. Hopefully you do a lab where you do that.
And so if it's insoluble, we're gonna write calcium phosphate. So, so calcium is a two plus charge and phosphate is a three negative. So we're gonna cross our charges. Since phosphate's a polyatomic ion, I'm gonna put parentheses around it. All right, now that is not my only product. I have some other things, okay? So I've used the calcium and I've used the phosphate. And some of you may be recognizing this from when we did types of reactions, but we did a type of reaction called a double replacement. Um, or a double displacement. Some books call it replacement, some call it displacement, where basically they swap partners. And so for this one, phosphate has left potassium and gone to be with calcium. And so it's traded out metals. So it's changed the, the potassium metal for the calcium metal. So what's gonna happen is the calcium metal is no longer gonna be with chlor chlorine as it goes to the phosphate. So let's finish the other part. We've used phosphate and I've used calcium. So left, I have, my arm's in the way, but potassium chloride. And you still have to balance your charges. So chlorine is a one negative and potassium is a one, chlorine's a one negative and potassium's a one positive. So I just leave the charges like that like I don't have to put subscripts because they're balanced out. Now, one thing about this problem is it's not done yet because this equation is not balanced. So we have to balance it. It's been a while, we can do this. As I balance this with polyatomic ions, I want you to remember to think of the polyatomic ion since phosphates is in the reactant and in the products, we're gonna balance it as one group. So I've got potassium here, so let's just start with potassium. I have three over here and I only have one, so I need three. But that gives me three potassiums and three chlorines. So let's look at phosphate. So I have one phosphate. This is gonna be a problem we're really gonna to have to just play with a lot, okay? I have one phosphate and I have two phosphates. So I need two phosphates over here. So if I put a two over here, that gives me six potassiums, right? Two times three is six. So I don't need three potassiums, I need six potassiums. All right, so now I not only have six potassiums, but I have six chlorines. And so in order to get six here, I got a two chlorine, so I've got to multiply it. Two times three is six, so I put a three there. So let's check. I have six potassiums and six potassiums, two phosphates and two phosphates, and I have three calciums and three calciums and six chlorines and six chlorines. Also, something I realized I didn't finish is I left, I didn't finish the phase symbols. So this one, it says it's soluble in water, so it's an aqueous. This is the sol solid, so we're gonna put an S there because that's the precipitate that you're gonna see fall out of the solution. 